Well, aloha and good morning. Happy Aloha Friday. I'm Ryan Kalesuji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii. Uh, we've made it through the end of another week here. For some of you uh, watching this right now, you may be watching this at home. Happy Kamehameha Day to those of you who are able to enjoy the day off. Uh, for those of you that are working, we have two other people that will be joining us today that are also hard at work uh, that we're going to be interviewing and talking to specifically about tourism this morning, Yanji. That's right, Ryan. We are talking to Kelly Sanders of Highgate Hotels, which owns a number of properties here in the islands, along with Mufi Hanneman from the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging, Lodging and Tourism Association. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for being here. Kelly, I want to start with you. Um, you know, you drive through Waikiki, you see that the visitors are back. Let's start with who's coming here right now. Well, aloha and happy Kamehameha Day. It's nice to be working. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, it's all U.S. travel currently coming to uh, the islands. Um, and as you think about um, uh, Waikiki, uh, we have seen a, a significant uptick in overall uh, arrivals from the mainland um, with uh, a number of new flights from, from uh, many of the carriers, as well as uh, larger larger planes coming in from uh, from from many destinations. So. This, the overall seat count is up uh, from the U.S., but um, as you uh, are aware, we still have no travel coming in from any international, Canada, Australia, Japan, Korea. So what we're seeing is uh, a lot of U.S.-based uh, uh, travel coming in and a lot of new visitors to Hawaii, a lot of first-time visitors to Hawaii, uh, um, which is uh, nice to see in some ways, but also uh, an opportunity for us to to really uh, take forward the Malama program and make sure that they understand, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here as a state in protecting our natural resources and giving back to uh, the islands. So uh, a lot of education is going on, uh, I know, within our hotels uh, with a, a, a lot of these new visitors um, that are, are coming for the first time. But uh, it's exciting to have new, 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 new people. You know, Hawaii is a major repeater destination, um, and so as we get these new visitors coming for the first time, I'm sure that will uh, be a positive in the future as people want to return back to our beautiful islands. And Mufio, just as a follow up to that question, uh, you know, we do see more people uh, here in the islands, uh, here in Waikiki. Uh, what have you been hearing from the other hotels? Uh, are, are most of the properties and uh, other establishments that you help to uh, work with, uh, are they seeing just sort of business as normal? Uh, are there still some hotels that are not fully up to speed with, with those they brought back to work? What are we seeing on the, uh, the business end in terms of what's open and what's not? Well, Ryan and, and Yunji, it's good to be with you again. So, you know, HLTA, Hawaii Lodging Tourism Association, is a statewide organization. So we have uh, hotels in, uh, that are our members uh, in every county, every island. So definitely the neighbor islands are at a much more robust uh, pace than, than Oahu uh, for reasons that Kelly has just uh, stated. Uh, domestic travel is, uh, is really uh, going very well. Uh, so in that stamp, from that standpoint, they've had to maybe ramp up uh, a little quicker uh, than Oahu because we still have uh, major international travel that comprises about half uh, of the visitors uh, in a normal year that come to Oahu. So um, some of the, the challenges they've been facing, obviously, is because it's coming back so quickly, is making sure that we can hire back as many people as possible. It's not just felt uh, within the hotels, uh, but also in small businesses and restaurants and the like and retail. Uh, so that's been uh, sort of a challenge. But, you know, the fact that we are coming back, there's demand. So people are, you know, should look past the fact that Uncle Sam gives them a paycheck till September of this year. Uh, and therefore, maybe sometimes look at it that I make more money staying at home than going back to work. We need you. We need you to come back uh, because the overall economy is what we're concerned about, that we have to continue to move forward. You know, we still have one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. There's still about 50,000 people that are out of work. So the more that we can get back to a situation where there's some form of normalcy, the better off we're going to be. So the neighbor islands are doing very well, uh, a little bit better than Oahu. But what's really good, as Kelly alluded to, is that the sense of optimism, of hope, uh, is there. And uh, whatever the challenges might be, uh, that's to me, is, is minor compared to the fact that uh, where we were a year ago when we were basically all shut down. 
You know, I'm seeing a lot of comments here. I'm curious to know about the profile of the Taurus kind of diving deeper. Miguel has has something to say, and I'm I'm curious, Kelly, if this is if this is perception or reality. He says Tourists are careless. Not now with all the low fares come to to come to Kauai, we're full with the wrong type of tourist. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a fair criticism, but what you know, what is the profile of who's coming here in terms of how budget conscious they are? Um, of course, we're missing the you know high high dollar spent international tourists. Are we making up for that with the folks who are coming here now? Yeah, so I, uh, I I won't say that there is ever a wrong tourist uh, to visit. I mean, Hawaii is uh, a special place, and people want to experience it. We we have opened up, uh, or there has been opened up, uh, new flights from Orlando, uh, from Austin, from, uh, Phoenix, you know, uh, Vegas. Um, all of those new flights are allowing um, uh, customers that probably didn't have the opportunity to come to Hawaii before to join. I think it is our or uh, our responsibility to to really make sure that we are spending time uh, with these tourists to make sure they're respecting our our environment and uh, um, the the culture uh, that is so critical to Hawaii. But it, it is uh, it is a different customer um, and it is uh, a, a customer that uh, is new to Hawaii for the first time. And some um, some challenges, I think, that we've seen in in trying to uh, make sure they understand the importance of the culture and, and what's going on. But uh, that's our job. Uh, and I think it's the, the job of HTA and uh, all of the, the organizations that support Hawaii uh, to to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to to make sure that um, we, we're educating these uh, travelers about the responsibility uh, that that we take um, for Hawaii and, and our islands. And you, if, if I might just add to that uh, on that answer, so what we're also experiencing is that, and I think people need to understand this, is that not. Everyone that comes to Hawaii, whether it's in this time or in the future, is not going to always stay at a lodging property, at a resort, at a hotel. Uh, more people are staying at transient vacation rentals. Uh, and uh, our concern has always been uh, that these transient vacation rentals exist in areas where they are deemed legal, that they're not illegal. Uh, because uh, our feeling is that that's where that educational process that Kelly was alluding to, where they come into a hotel resort, uh, we're telling them uh, to all about the Malama program that we expect visitors uh, while they're here, if they love Hawaii. Please, uh, you know, do what you can to give back, uh, see what you can to help uh, our community here in areas that uh, the visitors use a lot and so forth. So uh, that I think is contributing maybe some of the things uh, that people are seeing that automatically assume that uh, they're not being responsible and that they're all staying in these pocket areas of Waikiki, Koalina, uh, and the North Shore. That's that's not necessarily true. And we've seen with statistics that the increase in people staying at transit vacation rentals is much higher than it is in the increase we've seen in people staying in the hotels during this period as we're coming back. Yeah. You know, you've, you've both mentioned the important role that HTA plays in educating these visitors that are coming to the islands, and yet the legislature uh, has proposed cutting their funding uh, and, and really reorganizing the way in which uh, the Hawaii Tourism Authority is managed. Mufi, I want to uh, get your thoughts on that. Uh, what do you think the role of HTA should be, and, and do you agree with the way that the legislature uh, has positioned themselves and this bill that is in, before the governor uh, in the restructuring of what and how the HTA uh, operates? There are many things I agree with our good friends at the legislature about, but in this particular instance, uh, I have to uh, disagree. Uh, we put together a letter to the governor about uh, HB, House Bill 862 and Senate Bill 200 uh, that speaks to the very issue that you're talking about, signed by 35 organizations throughout the state, not all tourism organizations. Every chamber group signed on to it. Labor organization signed on to it. Retail merchants signed on to it. Environmental groups signed on to it. And it's all about making sure that we appreciate and understand that HTA has a critical role to play. And they need a dedicated source of funding to carry on their responsibilities. And long before the pandemic, 
Uh, we recognized that it was important to manage tourism better and not put all our eggs in the basket of marketing tourism. So what this will do would be tie the hands uh, of the mission of HTA in going forward with these plans that they're working on a community-based uh, process with every county where all the stakeholders are there, pro-tourism people, people who have some questions about tourism. So we want them to be able to fully execute that plan. Also, uh, these measures call for uh, HTA now uh, to compete with every other group uh, because hence in going forward, they'd have to get their monies, what is called the general fund. Right now, it's a special fund. Whatever we collect from the TAT goes for three specific purposes, transit accommodation tax, marketing, managing Hawaii uh, tourism, secondly, the convention centers objectives and assistance to the counties. So all of those things will be put in jeopardy because of having to go now to the general fund every year where HDA will have to go and ask for its funding as opposed to ensuring that whatever we're collecting uh, is how it was set up. And that's when HDA came into being, it was said they would have their dedicated source of funding from here. But here's one of the most egregious part of it too. They now are taking away the funding to the counties and saying to them, raise the transit accommodations tax by another 3%. So that 10.25 now becomes 13.25. When you add the general excise tax to that, uh, the governor is right in pointing out his concern, as he said recently, Governor Ige, that we've now become the most expensive leisure destination in the United States. So we're in a competitive business. Yes, um, you know, people love Hawaii, and that's what we're experiencing now. But if they can go someplace else, uh, and exercise responsible tourism in those destinations, they'll stop coming here. And with one lesson that we learned from this pandemic, how totally dependent uh, everyone is on tourism. Like it, <laughs> loathe it, what have you. You know, this is the engine that drives our economy. We can continue to pursue economic diversification initiatives and activities and the like, but at the end of the day, especially now, it'll come back to tourism. So if tourism doesn't come back in any shape or form, small businesses will continue to suffer. Retails, mom and pop stores, restaurants, dining facilities, attractions, all of those things that people are dependent upon for their jobs. Well, Kelly, I want to get your thoughts also on that measure. And, you know, I think there is a perception in the community that that is unfair, frankly, uh, that HTA just markets Hawaii and that's basically all they do. Can you talk to us? I know that you've served on that board, not currently, but in the past. Can you talk to us about the importance of HTA, especially for a business like yours and, and doing the things that Mufi was talking about? Yeah, so HTA was originally created to manage uh, the brand of Hawaii and uh, ensure that we um, spoke globally to the world about our culture uh, and the, the, you know, what's important. And it was a marketing organization uh, that was established to, to, um, to, to really make sure people understood what Hawaii was all about. Over my time uh, on the board, the last four years, I just um, exited the board in March. Um, we spent a lot of time coming up with uh, a new strategic plan that really focused in not just on marketing, but on really responsible tourism and uh, really reaching out to the different counties um, and working through uh, areas that were high traffic um that that we didn't want people to go um you know a do not promote list uh or all the hotels to to make sure we're not sending people into neighborhoods to to make sure we're not sending in people into hikes that are unsafe um and and really working through um trying to find the the high spending visitor um and uh the, the right visitors to hawaii that that will uh give back and that that that, that understand and i think this bill kind of guts uh, the, the the ability for HTA to really carry out their strategic plan in, um, you know, protecting our natural resources, dry, uh, uh, you know, the culture of Hawaii, um, everything that we've done for the counties to really bring everybody into uh, focus groups to talk about how each county, because every county is affected differently by tourism. Uh, and we want to, to be the voice and kind of the conduit that could go out to all of the other state agencies to really help 
try to manage tourism overall. And I, and I think that this bill makes it impossible for HTA to be successful. You know, another issue that has somewhat come up here, not only here in Hawaii, but just throughout the country, it has been the lack of availability for rental cars. We're seeing it, uh, of course, the prices for those who are trying to book accommodations uh, for rental cars. Uh, we're also seeing just the lack of uh, availability for rental cars for even local residents who are maybe traveling to a neighbor island for you know, a weekend vacation. Mufi, I'm wondering if there is anything, any insights that you know, or is there anything that is being discussed on how, you know, what kind of support might be out there for not only visitors, but locals as well to find a means of transportation during their vacations? Well, in, in working with HTA, uh, and once again, that's why they serve a very useful purpose, um, is trying to come up with some proactive recommendations before the visitors get here. Um, you know, and, and let's face reality, they sold off 40% of their inventory uh, during that pandemic year. And it's not so easy to just purchase new cars and, and bring them back to the islands. We understand there's a shortage of semiconductor computer chips uh, that are used in these cars uh, so that they can be uh, ready to go uh, when they ship it and get it here. That being the case, there's been a series of recommendations that we put out there, including really doing what they can to try to uh, book a, a reservation for a car before they get here. Uh, and certainly HTA is also taking the lead uh, in working with the counties. Uh, for example, with Kauai, they're gonna do a shuttle service, uh, help subsidize a shuttle service from the airport to the resort areas beginning in July. And that template may be used with other areas here. So we're trying to uh, work with others. We certainly don't wanna see any price gouging taking place. We know that there are some very responsible rental car operations uh, that are, trying to do this within limits and the like. And we're always hearing anecdotally about some of the prices that are being uh, passed on. So um, it's something of major concern. And this is one of the challenges that we have in coming back is to try to address this in a way that, that doesn't discourage or uh, mar our reputation of being a great place to come uh, and uh, at a price that you can afford. Yeah. And I, I if I could just add to that, you know, I think none of us, uh, no one in the industry expected tourism to rebound as quickly as it has uh, from, uh, especially from the U.S. Um, uh, and 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 so we're, we're not prepared um, in a lot of ways. Uh, we don't have enough rental cars. As Mufi stated, it's hard to get some employees to come back to work. So a lot of restaurants that um, would love to be open today have not been able to be open because we just we don't have the the uh, employees to to come back. So you're seeing lo long lines around restaurants, uh, people unable to actually get reservations to to, to eat. So um, there are a lot of challenges that we're facing because we are seeing a, a much bigger demand than we had anticipated, and, and really with just only U.S. based travel. So um, lots of Lots of interesting things to work through, for sure. You, you know, Mufi, Kelly mentioned something that was interesting, this idea of trying to keep tourists in certain areas, keep them out of certain residential neighborhoods, um, not to not necessarily, you know, cordon off areas, but just to say, let's keep our tourists in the tourist district for the most part so that it has less impact on people. We've talked to the governor about this, um, for instance, looking uh, at Maui on Maui and perhaps having some more reservation systems like they do for Haleakala. What is the, what is the industry's take on that uh, on, on actually putting some limits in um, certain, you know, uh, destinations, hikes, for instance, doing more permitting to kind of lessen the impact so that residents don't necessarily feel like everybody's just coming, you know, walking by their house. You know, uh, Yunji, uh, the industry does not oppose impact user fees, uh, mm -hmm. which has proven to be very successful here on Oahu. When I was a member of the Honolulu City Council in the mid 90s, uh, is when um, I fostered uh, legislation and working with my colleagues there, that if we're going to charge a fee to enter and use Hanama Bay, it should be put into a special fund. And that special fund should go back to the ongoing preservation, education uh, efforts uh, and to maintain uh, the, the preserve. Uh, so that was done in the mid nineties. And I think that's worked out pretty well. They just recently, um, uh, increase the fees for a visitor to go and use the, the bay uh, to a $25 fee. I think that's okay. Uh, as long as residents don't get charged, of course, to go to the beach because that's anathema to our culture. 
But the equitable aspect of it is that when you park or you choose to park at Hanama Bay, you will pay the same fee that a visitor would pay. So I think more of that should be done uh, to control, uh, and not only control, but to maintain, preserve, uh, and make sure that uh, ongoing repairs and improvements can be done. Uh, and uh, we would encourage that to occur. What we are concerned about, however, is that whenever you have uh, a fee of this nature, we don't want to see it going into the general fund as they're proposing now with the TAT, throw everything into the general fund, then it can be used for anything under the sun. We want it to go back, as they had to that Hanama Bay model, those fees that are assessed there goes back to the ongoing use of Hanama Bay, preservation, education, environmental efforts there. I think that's the template that should be used throughout the state to do more of that, not less of that. And now with the apps to do online reservations and bookings and the like, all of that really makes sense uh, to do more of. Uh, Kelly, I want to ask you this question. Uh, of course, you had mentioned some of the struggles that businesses are facing uh, right now, uh, but specifically for uh, your organization, your company, of course, you manage hotels, but there's a number of also businesses that operate within uh, your hotels as well. well what are you seeing uh, on your end with those businesses? Because we still see a lot of them continue to be shut down. Uh, is, is there any plan on when some of those may reopen? And how do you manage that balance between those types of businesses that uh, help to supplement, of course, the hotel experience for your guests there, uh, but also realizing that they may also be struggling as well. Yeah, it's a, it's been an ongoing um, uh, challenge. I mean, we, we have 42 retail tenants in our hotels uh, from restaurants to, um, you know, to, to shops. Uh, and uh, I think we've done a good job in, in getting most of those open. Um, I'm super excited that uh, Morimoto uh, uh, will open on the 25th of June. That's been a big focus of ours. Uh, that's a big part of the experience and, and we'll add a great, a great um, opportunity for more dining here in Waikiki, especially here at Alohilani. But um, it has been a challenge and, and it's been, uh, a lot of our restaurants have opened, but they're they're not able to stay open uh, as many hours. So hours have been cut back because they just don't have enough staff. So um, it is finding and and getting more staff to to come back to work, uh, which has been, as Mufi alluded to, a, a, a significant challenge with the current uh, unemployment three hundred dollars a week that that is uh, that is out there through September. Mo Mufi, I also want to get your thoughts on the crime that we've seen in Waikiki in recent weeks. Um, you know, uh, stories like that when they they, they travel fast back to uh, home destination, you know, the homes of these tourists, if they see things like that, um, and Hawaii can quickly have a reputation that is not favorable. What, what are your concerns when it comes to the crime in Waikiki? Well, the pre-pandemic uh, era, you know, we really worked very hard, everyone across the board, uh, to make sure that we were one of the safest uh, major cities uh, in America. And I think that was part of our, our marketing uh, competitive advantage that you could visit Hawaii and whether it be a natural or man-made disaster, uh, we were up to the, the task uh, to ensure uh, your safety and, and well-being. Uh, and so as we've gone into this pandemic situation, we've now developed a reputation due to safe travels that, you know, we want healthy visitors to come here. Yes, we're going to require uh, COVID testing. Uh, 72 hours before, and you may even have to quarantine. Uh, so all of those things, I think, has made for, to me, a very good brand uh, appeal, if you will, that Hawaii is a safe and healthy place to come and visit. Uh, and our local residents are also uh, doing their best uh, with their work environment, if their family settings and the like, uh, to also set the example. That being said, the two most recent examples in Waikiki uh, certainly uh, take away from, from that reputation. And we're very concerned. And not only we're very concerned, we're gonna step up to the plate quite quickly uh, in bringing together the stakeholders as we've done once a year in what we call our Visitor Annual Public Safety Conference. We did that very successfully a few years ago when the situation along Allures and Beachwalk was getting kind of out of hand uh, with some of the uh, cabaret establishments that uh, were operating to 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, military, local folks mixing there. Uh, sometimes the situations got out of hand uh, and we put together this kind of dialogue with uh, HPD and all the stakeholders 
uh, the county administration, uh, of course, uh, our Waikiki operators. Uh, and it's very different today. Market increase, better lighting, more people are on it, much more aware. Everyone's become more responsible. So we think the same thing needs to be done. So we're going to be meeting again uh, next week uh, with Prosecutor Steve Ahm, uh, with uh, Council Chair Tommy Waters, who represents Waikiki, uh, with Mayor Blanjardi and his administration, and our new acting police chief to see what we can do uh, in the short term with the low-hanging fruit to ensure uh, that these things don't keep reoccurring and that we send a loud and clear message as we come back. We don't want people, we don't want our residents, we don't want our workers to feel that public safety is being compromised. So I'm very hopeful that great results will come out of it, like a weed and seed program, perhaps, that Prosecutor Steve Ahm is talking about establishing that in Waikiki with community buy-in and involvement to, to be part uh, of the solution as opposed to just complaining, as opposed to just complaining about the problem. You know, our time is wrapping up here, but we did want to provide an opportunity for uh, one final thought. Kelly, we're going to start off with you. I I'm just wondering, as we look forward uh, to the summer months ahead, uh, the benchmarks that the state has set with reopening and making some changes with the vaccine uh, vaccine verification program that could also allow more uh, visitors to arrive. Uh, what are your What is your thoughts looking ahead into the summer and the outlook for tourism overall? Yeah, I mean, I uh, um, I think we're seeing summer demand from the U.S. Uh, uh, again, we're we're still not where we were in 2019. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't see much of a change. Um, I think what we're seeing today will probably continue. The market will run uh, probably a, a, for Waikiki uh, specifically. We'll probably run about 70 percent occupancy for the summer. That'll, that'll lead into the fall. Um, really, really what um, I think everyone needs to be prepared for is once international travel returns, once Canada, Australia, Japan, Korea, once those other markets that currently cannot fly or do not fly to Hawaii come back, uh, there's, there's going to be an unprecedented global demand for travel. Uh, people have not been able to travel for two years and Hawaii will will see a lot of that travel, um, and we need to be prepared. And I know uh, I, that HTA is working very hard to do what they can to make sure that that we're ready to um, to, to support um, er everything that and the infrastructure and everything in Hawaii. But it, it is going to be uh, uh, two years of global unprecedented travel um, uh, for every destination around the world, and Hawaii will be a part of that. And Mufi, your th final thoughts as we look ahead to this uh, s summer months of travel and, and the future of what we uh, can expect to see tourism looking like. Uh, I think we're all in this together. And I know there's some that will always be concerned that we're so dependent on a single industry here. Well, you know, many initiatives have been tried in the past to diversify the economy. It's still coming back to tourism. So to be able to deal with this in a very short term here, to get people back to work, get people back to where it was, prior to the pandemic, we really need to come together, set aside some of the, you know, doubts and criticisms that you have about tourism in general. We get it. We understand it. We're trying to manage it responsibly because it's not just about visitors coming here. It's about our local residents who are entirely dependent upon a good economy fueled by tourism to have a good wage, a good comfortable living and be able to raise their families in a great place that we call home. So we're all in this together. We shouldn't be spending so much time trying to throw darts at each other and figuring out there's another economic diversification effort. It's not, it's tourism. And we wanna work with you to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is the issue top of mind for so many, and we appreciate you diving deep with us on it this morning. Mufi Hanneman and Kelly Sanders, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, and Ryan, I think you're muted. <laughs> I am muted. There we go. Uh, you know, great to hear from both of them and just getting their thoughts on the future of tourism, of course, but also uh, about what they're seeing. Uh, you know, we heard Kelly Sanders mention early on that a lot of the profile of what they're seeing now in Waikiki are first time visitors to the islands, mm -hmm. those 
who have not yet been able to come here to experience uh, a vacation here in Hawaii. And a lot of that due to some of those new routes that were started. Of course, we know that Hawaiian Airlines has launched their new service, uh, direct service from Orlando, as well as Austin. And so we are seeing different types of visitors who maybe never had the, that direct opportunity to do so. Uh, we're seeing them here right now. That's right. And, and Kelly also brought up a good point that this is without the influx of the foreign tourists that we are going to be seeing at some point once those vaccination programs and, uh, you know, that those agreements are worked out when those the Australians, the Japanese, the Chinese, uh, all, the Canadians, when those folks all come back, um, you think that there aren't rental cars now, just wait. So how do we deal with all those infrastructure demands uh, when we don't really have, you know, he, I thought it was very interesting that he said that, you know, we didn't expect it to come back so, roaring back so quickly. Um, and, and now here we are. So a lot of those uh, first time visitors, you know, Hawaii is a very popular destination that has a lot of repeat guests. So how do we turn those into long term relationships, uh, while still maintaining the things that we love? I know that a lot of folks got used to having no one on the beach. And so there is an adjustment period that we're all experiencing now. And you heard Mufi say that we really need to be all in this together because our economy depends on it. And something that they both echoed is the need for the Hawaii Tourism Authority uh, to be able to maintain uh, the current structure and funding in order to assist in, in these efforts to help educate visitors and to help manage and control those coming to the islands. Of course, uh, that bill that is before the governor that the legislature passed would drastically change the way in which the HTA operates. And so we'll see what the governor decides to do. That intent to veto list and deadline is coming up in just a few weeks. And so we'll hear more from the governor about his plans, about what he wants to do with not only that, but with, but, but some other questionable measures that are before him right now uh, that the legislature passed during the last legislative session. Yeah, we'll talk to him about that the next time we have on. Starting on Monday, we're going to be having uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green will be joining us. Um, we, of course, want to talk to him about the Safe Travels program and the vaccine rollout. Um, you know, he's obviously very involved in both programs. So we'll get his take on how we get to those thresholds that the governor set out, the 60 percent of fully vaccinated and then the 70 percent to really lift almost all the restrictions. So we'll be talking with him about that on Monday. We do appreciate you spending your holiday if you did have one today with us. Uh, happy Kamehameha Day and happy Aloha Friday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you right back here on Monday at 1030. Aloha.